Hello, and welcome to the 2022 Virginia Festival of the Book, featuring Keep It Concise, Microfiction, and Short Stories. I'm Sarah Lawson, Associate Director of the Virginia Center for the Book, a program of Virginia Humanities. Thanks for joining us. A couple notes before we begin. Please share your questions for the authors using the Q&A tab on Zoom. Also, this event has closed captioning, which you can turn on and customize at any time with the tab at the bottom of your window. If you haven't already read today's books, we hope you will. For details about how to buy them from a local bookseller, visit vabook.org, where you can also explore the schedule of upcoming programs and watch past events. While you're there, please consider making a donation to support the festival's ongoing work at vabook.org give. We appreciate the support of our community partner for helping share information about today's event, UVA LGBT Com Committee for Faculty and Staff. Thanks also to our bookseller for this event, Fountain Bookstore in Richmond, Virginia. Now, I'm pleased to introduce today's speakers. Kim Fu, author of the story collection, Lesser Known Monsters of the 21st Century, is also the author of For Today, I Am a Boy, winner of the Edmund White Award for Debut Fiction, finalist for the Penn Hemingway Award, and a New York Times Book Review Editor's Choice. She lives in Seattle. Daniel Olivas, author of How to Date a Flying Mexican, New and Collected Stories, is the author of 10 books and editor of two anthologies. He has also written for the New York Times and The Guardian. And Rand Walker, author of Keep It 100, 100 Word Stories, is an award-winning author of 23 books. He teaches creative writing at Hampton University and for Writer's Digest University. Rand lives in Hampton, Virginia with his wife and daughter. Our moderator today is Joe Loyacano, who teaches script writing in the School of Media Arts and Design at James Madison University. Thank you all so much for being here today. Joe, take it away. All right, thanks so much. We have a great panel here. Um, I uh, will just preface, Sarah just gave a great introduction to these and you know, sort of casually mentioned, hey, buy these books. Um, I'll just say, as a person who has read all these books, buy these books. Um, I, I, loved, uh, I, I loved spending time with them. Um, it, it was uh, just, uh, they are all great. Um, and I really enjoyed my time with them. So I strongly encourage you to do it. I'll, I'll throw a little, a little bit more at the end too, to, as a reminder to everybody to seek out these books because um, they really are great. What I think would be a great start is to hear from uh, each of our authors because many of you uh, may be unfamiliar um, with their work. So um, I've asked each of them to just uh, prepare a little bit to tell us um, you know, a quick preface to what um, their uh, work is about and then to read a passage um, from that work. Or in the case of Ran, who's doing 100 word stories, read a couple of those stories to give us a little taste of what those stories are like. So um, Kim, would you mind uh, kicking it off for us. Sure thing. Uh, thanks so much, Joe. And thank you so much to the Virginia Festival of the Book for having all of us. I'm really excited. Uh, so my collection, Lesser Known Monsters of the 21st Century, uh, is a bit of a genre bending collection of stories. Uh, there's some speculative stories and some fantastical stories and some more realist ones. Uh, most of them have monsters, either literal ones or metaphorical ones. Um, I'm going to read a, a little bit from the very beginning of a story called 20 Hours. After I killed my wife, I had 20 hours before her new body finished printing downstairs. I thought about how to spend the time. I could clean the house as a show of contrition, and when she returned to find me sitting at the shining kitchen island, knickknacks in place on dusted shelves, a pot of soup on the stove, we might not even need to discuss it. I could buy flowers. I could watch the printing, which still fascinated me, the weaving and webbing of each layer of tissue, the cross-sectional view of her internal workings like the ring sections of a tree trunk. I had poisoned her, a great wallop of poison in her morning coffee. So I didn't have the defense of passion, a momentary loss of reason. Poison took forethought. Poison said, I wanted to be apart from you for a while. Then why not just leave the house? Why not go for a walk? No, it said more than that. Poison said, I wanted you to not exist for a while. I wanted to move through the world without you in it. There'd been no choking, gasping, flailing, spewing. Connie simply keeled over at the table. The soft thunk of her weighty head, the clatter of her empty cup tipping off the saucer, spilling its dregs. Painless, I hoped, though I would have to take her word for it later either way. I wrapped her briskly in a sheet, put her out on the porch, and filled out the online form for same-day pickup. I'll leave it there. Thank you. Thanks so much, Kim. That was uh, 
I remember reading those opening lines and it just it felt, it felt like I was reading a Black Mirror episode. Um, you know, many, many of your uh, stories reminded me of that, but um, thanks, thanks so much for sharing that with us. Um, uh, Daniel, uh, would you mind uh, reading from your work as well? Yes, and thank you. And thank you to the uh, Virginia Festival of the Book. Um, I'm gonna read the uh, first page of How to Date a Fine Mexican, the title story of my new book. Rule number one, don't tell anyone about the flying part. After the second night, Conchita witnessed Moises flying in his backyard under the moonlight. And after the first night, they shared her bed, which happened to be the second night, she witnessed him flying in his backyard under the moonlight. She realized that no one, not even her sister, Julieta, could learn of her new novio's extraordinary talent. What would people think? Certainly gossip would spread throughout the neighborhood, eventually migrating south out of Los Angeles and down below the border to Conchita's hometown of Ococlan via whispered phone calls, wisecracking emails, and even terse though revealing postcards. Yes, the chisme would most certainly creep out of the city limits inexorably spreading like a noxious fog, finally reaching all of her friends and family who would shake their collective head about, about poor Conchita Lozano de la Peña, finally going loca. And of course, they would proclaim such madness involved lust. See what happens when you don't settle down like all good Catholic Mexican women and marry a man who can give you children and something to look forward to in old age. No God-fearing woman should enter her sixth decade of life as Conchita had two years earlier without having walked down the aisle to accept the sacrament of marriage. And it makes no matter that Conchita certainly doesn't look her age with skin as smooth as Indian pottery combined with a voluptuous figure that would knock the false teeth out of any mature and eligible man. But that's the problem, you see. Too much fun, not enough pain. And now Conchita thinks she has fallen in love with a Mexican who can fly. Ay, Chihuahua. Thank you, Daniel. That's great. Um, and last but not least, uh, Ran, would you mind uh, reading a couple of your 100-word um, stories for us? Sure. Thank you, Joe, and uh, I'm very honored to be here this evening. Thank you so much to the Virginia Festival of the Book. I'm going to read three stories from my collection, Keep It 100. I'm going to start with the simple one called The Mouse. By the way, this collection, uh, Keep It 100, is 100 stories. Each of them are 100 words apiece. The Mouse. We marveled at how the mouse's palate must have been far more sophisticated than the peanut butter and cheddar cheese we've been placing on the traps. We began to experiment with different cheeses, exotic and imported, eager to find something it might like. Just as we were lost in our experiments and had long since deemed the idea of trapping and killing the mouse futile and even barbaric, we focused our energies on trying to find a way to please it. It never ate the cheese though, which led us to slowly wonder if the mouse was ever really there. Okay, the second story is called Colorful. Seeking to add to his budding authorial legend, Princeton Watts planned to acquire a pet of sufficient exoticism. Flannery O'Connor kept a yard full of peacocks and Salvador Dali enjoyed strutting an anteater down the sidewalk so whatever Princeton acquired had to be shocking. Having grown up on the dark crystal, he selected the cassowary, an enormous colorful bird that resembled a skexis. The bird was perfect for a fancy writer. He understood his mistake only when he watched the bird withdraw its long claw from his abdomen after an attempted feeding. His blood, just another color, among the feathers. And I will close with a story titled 
fashion, and the art of reading. To assume that she read the book, I mean, excuse me, to assure that she read the book, she refused to put it on her shelf after she purchased it. Instead, she carried it from room to room, setting it on the sofa arm or the dining room table. She even placed it in her purse to carry with her, just in case a moment presented itself for her to read it, maybe standing in a line at a store or while rolling through an automated car wash. She occasionally finished a page or two, never really putting a dent in the book, which she gradually accepted had become merely a fashion accessory. Love that. I love that. Thank you so much, Ryan. Um, so uh, one of the things I would like to, and, and thanks to all three of you, I didn't thank the Academy either. You all did such a great job thanking the Virginia <laughs> Fence of the book. Um, and I didn't do it at the start. So I guess this is uh, my last moderation uh, for the Fence of the book because I didn't thank the Academy at the beginning. But um, yes, thank you so much. I mean, this is one of the things that over the years has been so great um, as, a, as a Virginian who's very close uh, to Charlottesville. Um, it's a it's a really great thing that we put on each year, um, and so I'm glad that we can bring uh, such great authors uh, like the three of you um, to talk about your work. So uh, we'll kind of run this back in reverse order here because I, I, I thought we'd start with a, a question. And those of you in the audience who have questions, uh, please feel free to enter those in the Q and A, um, and we'll try and work those into our conversation here. Um, but Rand's collection uh, opens with a quote by George Saunders. And this was a really weird thing. I was reading your collection at the same time I was reading uh, uh, Nick Offerman's latest book, um, where he goes on a hiking trip with George Saunders and um, Jeff Tweedy, the lead singer of Wilco. And so it was funny how both of these things popped up within a couple of days of each other. Um, uh, but your work, uh, Ran, opens with a novel is just a uh, quote by George Saunders, a novel is just a story that hasn't yet discovered a way to be brief. Um, as these three works, your, your uh, uh, Kim, Daniel, and, and Ran, uh, your works represent short fiction, and this panel is bringing together um, that concision. What's your motivation for writing in this format, and how does that affect your writing process? Right, Rand, if you want to start. Okay. Sure, <laughs> sure. Uh, my motivation is simply because I got tired of writing things that were much longer than I really felt they should be. When I first started writing, I was writing novels and I felt like, well, I started with the NaNoWriMo process where you sit in a chair, you write 1,000, uh, what is it? 1,667 words a day. And I just felt like I was really forcing a lot of the story out. And um, I started to envy the way the poets were doing it. They were able to capture these emotions in a much more finite space. And I decided that that was something I wanted to try to attempt with my own fiction. Um, now, how do I, what was the second part of your question again, Joe? My, my apologies there. Oh, um, no, it's okay. It was, um, how does that affect your writing process? Okay, so my writing process has gotten a lot more fluid. Than before it used to be very formalized where you sit there you get it done each day now i spend more time journaling and when it comes to actually writing stories i feel more like a kite that's just resting and then when the wind blows or the muse hits then i start to take flight and then when the wind stops i drift back down to earth so that's the process i've been doing which is radically different from what i was doing before but it, it works for me and i'm a lot more happy with the, the process and the what I produce from the process. Beautiful way to put it, uh, Daniel. What are your What are your your thoughts to those questions for um, your motivation for writing the format and um, about how that affects your writing process? Well, by day I'm a senior assistant attorney general with the California Department of Justice, so my day is filled basically doing environmental enforcement and land use and affordable housing, um, and I've been with the office now 32 years. So uh, my day is, is very full um, and I supervise a team of, of about 45 attorneys and paralegals. So the short form is uh, for me a matter of necessity. I have to, uh, I could not write a war and peace. Um, I have, you know, I'm working eight, nine, 10, 12 hours sometimes in my legal job. So whenever I am free to write short stories or uh, poems, or essays, 
they tend to be very concise and very um, uh, to the point. Um, I also think there is a true art to short fiction. Uh, you can write, for example, a Moby Dick and have hundreds of pages that could actually be excised out and the novel would be tighter and probably better. Um, and I'm sure there are people, uh, English uh, professors whose heads are spinning right now, but uh, a beautiful, perfectly balanced short story, every sentence matters, every word matters. And uh, as someone who plays with words every single day as a lawyer in writing briefs or editing uh, memos or, or, or other matters, um, I love the concept of, of, of um, editing. Um, um, one of the biggest challenges for me recently, I wrote an essay of 800 words, submitted it to Stanford Magazine, and they said, we love it, but it has to be 400 words. And I said, okay, here's a challenge. And I got it down. I got it down to, to their word requirements. So uh, um, the second part of your question, see, I, I'm just like, Rand, I don't know what your second part of the question was. What, what was that? <laughs> I, th I think you answered it. It's about how it affects your writing process, oh, which I think okay. is, is, you know, sounds like it's influenced by your, by your other career. It, it, yes. And who knows, maybe that's just how I'm wired. Perhaps even if I did not have a very demanding day job, maybe I would still be a short story writer. I don't know. Yeah. And, and your answer reminded me a lot of uh, Raymond Carver talking about his, his reasoning behind uh, writing short fiction. Um, he was working blue collar jobs during the week. And on the weekends, he said, well, I got 48 hours. I'll hole up in, in this office and, and plug away at it um, and then edit during the week. And so that was kind of the process there of, well, I got, I got a day job and then I got uh, this other part too. Um, and so the, it, was a, it was sort of a natural connection there. Um, and, and Kim, what are, what are your, uh, I'll, I'll replay them just one last time, um, your motivation for writing this format and how that affects your writing. I mean, I just, I love the short story form as a reader. Uh, so it felt, it felt natural to me, right? I love that so much is left implied. I love that there's all these things that only short stories can do. I love that you can read one, you know, in the time it takes you to commute to work or read or eat lunch, and then it can stay with you the rest of your life. Um, I think, even, even writing novels, which I also do, it is a matter of selection, right? You, when you write a novel, you're not telling every single second of someone, of, a, of every character's life from birth to death, right? You are choosing the pieces that make up the story you wanna tell. Uh, and I agree with a lot of what Daniel and Rand said, where the shorter the form you're working in, the more refined your answer to that question has to be. Um, I also had similar experiences. Like I used to work as a magazine editor um, and now I still teach. Um, and I, I love cutting, like I think it's one of my favorite things. Um, I once assigned a piece where I, I said, you know, 800 to a thousand words and they came back to me with 15,000. Um, and, you know, that was like a, in an involved process with this writer, but, but I, you know, I, I kind of loved it. I loved really like drilling down to like, what is important here? You know, like taking every beat and every sentence and every scene and saying, if you took this away, would the piece be fundamentally the same? Are we still hitting the same beats, the same emotional truths? Um, I really, I really enjoy that process, and so I feel like the form suits me in that way too. Yeah, yeah, um, and I, I think, uh, and and Daniel, I used to be a, a faculty member in the English department for eight years at, at JMU, and I know that Rand does uh, that as well. Um, uh, and I'll say I don't take any issue with what you said about Moby Dick. <laughs> Um, or, 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 or others, especially when you're talking about serialized works, uh, you're getting paid by the word there. So, um, uh, not, not to take anything away from it at all. Um, one of the questions that, that came up in the chat, I think is relevant to what we're talking about. So before we move on to the next, uh, sort of prepared question that we had, um, I think this is a great question to sort of pose to the, if, if any of the three of you have insight to this, um, uh, Sunny asked, uh, what's the best way to learn, uh, I, I presume to write uh, short and micro fiction. What's the best way to, to you know, start doing that? Um, do any of the three of you have an answer for that? To start, I would say read a lot of them and, uh, and sort of develop your own taste basically, like to read them thoughtfully in, in this, you know, to, to the most basic question is which ones do you like and then why, <laughs> right? And really break that down for yourself. What is it that you take away from the stories that you really love and that you would want to be doing with your fiction? Yeah, I agree 100 percent. I think with Stephen King and on writing his book on writing where he said it's really just a matter of reading a lot and writing a lot. And Kim hit the nail on the head. 
So if you're trying to learn something, even if you're trying to learn how to write a screenplay or write a play, you just have to read a lot of good ones, you know, figure out what actually works for you and try to discern as much as you can from what you read. Think about it like uh, puppeteers, like when I watch Sesame Street, you see Elmo. There's one part of you that sees Elmo. Then there's the puppeteer part of you that says like, okay, his hand is moving like this and I need to. So you start figuring out how people put these stories together. And the only way you do that is by reading a lot of them. I agree 100%. One of the things I noticed in, in my newest collection, it was uh, built primarily on reviewing almost 25 years of short fiction that I had published in different collections. And I chose my favorite strange tales and added a couple of new stories and i noticed some of the early, earlier stories um i could get the whiff of the people who were influenced me you know dejuna barnes and franz kafka um and um maybe a little bit hemingway yes i admit um and and so certainly those writers influence and many many others influenced me in my writing um and as Kim noted, you know, I, I, I would take what worked for me from those stories and then incorporate it in, into my style of writing, the way I approach um, literature. But read, read, read. You, you got to read. You can't be a writer unless you read. I, I love that. And I'm glad that this is being recorded because I can show this to my students when we return from spring break where I'm teaching them script writing. Um, I, te I teach script writing. And um, so I, you know, I'm good. This is one of the things I tell them, like, you got to watch a bunch of TV, which seems like the best homework assignment ever. But they want to debate me on it, on, on watching films. And but I'm like, this is the there's no shortcuts. That's what I always say. There's no shortcuts to um, you know, uh, learning how to write better or learning how to make films or any kind of art that you want to do. It's, it's a, it's a, it's a, um, long process there. So, um, well, moving on to our next question, um, Kim, if you don't mind, uh, kicking, kicking this one off, um, each of your works deal to some degree with ethics, humanity, and identity, uh, to, in different ways. Um, what inspires you to explore these subjects in your work? You know, when I'm writing first drafts, I try not to think about high level themes like that uh, and to like those kinds of abstractions and like the big moral questions that I'm grappling with. Um, I think when I'm writing first drafts, I'm trying to really focus on, on story and character and just like being true to the character and the story in the moment and like what happens next, what happens next. And to me, like those kinds of questions are for revision um, because I feel like what the themes that will enter your work are the things that you're thinking about. You know, they'll be your the questions of the moment. They'll be like the things that that you're concerned about, no matter what. Um, and I do think, you know, ethics, humanity, and identity. It's like that's that's what we're all thinking about, right? That is that's like what we're what we're swimming in. Um, and I, I sort of think, how would you not write about those things? You know, I feel like it is it is the so it is so core to storytelling to be to be exploring those questions. I feel like, you know, writing. Like literature in general is like uniquely suited uh, to be inhabiting, inhabiting other people, right? And to be expanding your sense of the world. And, um, and so I feel like, yeah, like I wouldn't know how to not write about humanity and identity and ethics. Like, what would you, what would you write about that? <laughs> I agree. I agree. Let's, let's see. Dan Daniel, what do you have to say to that? Everything I write is inherently political because I'm writing from a Chicano point of view and I center all my stories on people who look and sound like me and my family. Um, so, so even if a story might not be inherently um, or blatantly political, just the very fact that the main actors, the good, the bad, and the ugly are similar to my community, uh, that's a political statement by itself. Um, it, I do have a couple of stories in my new collection directly addressing Donald Trump's uh, family separation policy. I never mentioned his name. Um, once a dystopian future, which at the time that I wrote it, um, I, I thought perhaps it could happen, but we learned he attempted to make it happen. That is suspend the election. And that's happened in the story. And he built his wall and he microchips um, immigrant, uh, the children of immigrant um, adults and um, deports everyone else. Um, so I, 
when I hear someone say, oh, I don't, I don't do political, I'm, I can't, you know, when I hear that, I think, well, that's because you're coming from such a privileged place, you're incapable of challenging society, you're very fine with what society offers you if, if you don't do political. Yeah, yeah, it's great. Uh, Ran, um, same, same question for you. I think my answer is going to probably be a blend of both Kim's and Daniel's. Uh, when it comes to ethics, humanity, and identity, that's kind of, those are the things that, you know, in general, we tend to care about. So we write about the things that we, we care about. Um, but also understanding that, uh, like Daniel said, uh, coming from a particular culture, just telling your story is a radical expression in and of itself. And the good thing about having, you know, doing the 100 word stories is I have a lot of different ways I can play with that. Some of them can be very overt. Some of them can be very uh, hidden, almost to the point where you can't even find them at all. But uh, I agree with them. That's those are the things that that most writers are going to care about. And if you care about it, it will find its way into the work that you write. Can I add one one thing? And and both both Kim and, and Rand um, spoke to this well. Um, and, and when it comes to style. Um, I tend to use a lot of humor in my work. Um, I think for me, the primary goal in writing a strong piece of short fiction is number one, it has to be entertaining. It has to engage. It has to be funny. It has to be interesting. It has to touch um, the reader. Um, I don't use my short stories to give a political speech. Um, that's a whole different genre. That's, you know, writing uh, an op-ed, for example, which I've done for New York Times. I've written op-eds on political issues. That's a different skill set and different approach. So when I do write my short stories, and I don't want to give people the impression that, you know, th these are a bunch of political, I mean, the very title, How to Date a Flying Mexican. I mean, that kind of tells you where I'm coming from in terms of my approach. Um, um, I think you can you can make a political point um, in a artistic, interesting, engaging, and even funny way. So. Yeah, yeah. Thanks. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I think I think as we um, uh, ran, you've got one of your one of your stories where I remember a, a, a teacher and the student. Uh, there's this disconnect in who this person is. And so that's coming very much from what you all are talking about of this, uh, you know, this place of privilege where the teacher is saying, well, of course it's going to be this person. And the student is coming from a, from a, a completely different place. Um, so I think one of the things that is, that is uh, um, really evident, especially in, in Kim and Daniels, and then does appear in some of Rand's stories as well, um, would be magical realism. Um, and so, um, each of your works uh, blur those lines in some ways between imagination and reality. Um, you know, what is what is real and what is not. And I think all three of you write about that so well where I was like, I, I wanted to know what the answer, you know, like, well, what what's really happening? You know, I think I think when when we have good imaginative work, it always uh, makes us curious to know the answer. Um, uh, so can you tell us a little bit about what um, excites you about that exploration between um, the magical and the ordinary? And I'll just uh, start with Kim. On sure. Um, I think some things are some some emotions, let's say, I feel like are are something can feel to a character so big that expressing it through just a, a straightforward description of what's happening to them may not describe the feeling. So, you know, like, I, I feel like, you know, grief can feel so big that describing a funeral doesn't do it justice necessarily in that moment, right? Where describing it as a bug infestation or a sea monster, like, may, to me, feel like emotionally truer than, you know, than the straight description of, of like, a, of a deathbed scene. Um, that's how I feel sometimes in the moment. And I think, the other thing is, I feel like in, you know, real life, we are, stuck with what is, we are stuck with what is physically possible. And I feel like in art is one of those spaces where we can go beyond that, where we can, we have this chance to, to explore other worlds. And, you know, it's like, why not, why not take that opportunity? I guess. So in some ways it's like, because we can, as part of it. 
Yeah, great. Thanks. Um, Daniel, you've got a, a title story, <laughs> how, to, how to beta fly Mexican. Um, so, so um, and it's not flying. It's levitation. It's levitation. The planes um, fly, mosquitoes fly, kites fly, people levitate. <laughs> yeah. So, so tell us a little bit about, um, about that, that um, you know, uh, blurred line between imagination and reality. Growing up in the Mexican culture, um, early on, um, certainly within my family, uh, the concept or the curtain between this world and the next is, is a very sheer curtain. Um, and the belief system, um, uh, which is tied heavily to Catholicism, even though I'm no longer Catholic, I converted to Judaism many years ago, decades ago. Um, that kind of can shape your brain to see the world in a different way, that the physical world is not everything. Um, and with that basis, for example, the title story, I wanted to address um, the con some concept, sexism within, um, uh, within the culture and also within the Catholic religion in terms of what a woman should be doing. Um, and also the concept of falling in love um, and with someone who is uh, maybe different um, from um, what the culture accepts and what society accepts and therefore um, having um, Conchita who has never married and never will marry um, fall in love with a man who can fly. I can bring those concepts together through metaphor, through magic um, while telling a story that can be read purely on its magic, magical kind of plane. But if you wanted to go deeper and think about the symbolism behind some of the things in it, you could go there, but you don't have to. And that's why I like about magical realism. You don't have to go deeper if you don't want to. Yeah, great, thanks. Um, Rand, you've got uh, uh, characters often in, in your works who, um, well, not with all of them, we would put magical realism. We would say that they're imagining one reality while something else is going on. And so, um, you know, can you talk a little bit about where, where, you know, how that interests you as well? I get really jazzed about using any type of speculative element to a story. I was one of those kids that my mother would buy me whatever books I wanted. So I was like 10 years old asking for the Tommy Knockers by Stephen King. So I'm reading all these stories, uh, these dark stories and realizing that I'm not really in the stories or if I'm in the story, the description for me is black. Like Mike from it, black. I'm like, wow, what does that mean? Because there's so many shades of black people there's so many different things going on in the culture and we're summed up with one word and it's treated as if it's some type of a strange thing. So it didn't stop my love of reading those types of works, but it did make me want to participate in the dialogue in some way. Uh, there are writers out there already doing that, like Chanana Reeve Du, Victor Laval. I love the fact that people are giving Jordan Peele a lot of this love for his films. Uh, but the thing that excites me is that I get a chance to participate. Uh, I get a chance to create the things I would have wanted to see when I was younger. And I think that's the most special part of it. Just being there, being a part of it and being in dialogue with others who do the same thing. Yeah, I was, I was just, when you said that about Jordan Peele, I was just thinking about how he had one of my favorite comments uh, the, the year that Get Out came out where they were debating as to whether it was horror or drama and he said, it's a documentary. <laughs> uh, I think it's the best comment to come out of that Oscar season um, because it, it sort of showed the ignorance of the conversation and what he's trying to get at in that film. Um, we got a couple of questions that have been coming in through uh, the Q&A. So I do want to give some attention to that. Um, uh, so Sunny asked, uh, she said that, that Rand mentioned poetry. Um, and what is the difference for everybody here between poetry and short fiction, especially, um, you know, when we look at um, maybe even a shorter form like yours, ran where we're at 100 words, where do we run into prose poem versus, um, you know, short fiction itself? Um, uh, so um, um, how, 
how do you draw that line uh, um, between those differences? Whoever wants to, whoever wants to begin, out of the three of you. Okay, I can jump in on that one. So there's a writer named Nancy Stolman, and she actually has talked about this uh, before in her own uh, essays. Like, what is the difference between a 100 word story or microfiction piece and a prose poem? And then when you think about it, they're narrative poems. So you can have a narrative prose poem. Let me give you one more example. There is a writer by the name of Beth Ann Finley. She has a, a micro memoir called Heating and Cooling. Wonderful. It's just all these little tiny stories from her life. If you look in the acknowledgement section, a lot of those stories were originally published in poetry journals. So what I tell my students, and I know that there's always the argument about, oh, there's a narrative arc here. There's a Freitag plot pyramid. There's the <laughs> hero's journey. There's all these things going on. And that's fine and dandy for longer pieces. But a lot of times, especially with the way I write, I build from the bottom up. So if you think about what Augusto uh, Monterosso's dinosaur, um, when she awoke, the dinosaur was still there. That's the whole story. And then of course the apocryphal Ernest Hemingway for sale, baby shoes, never worn. If you start from there and build up, you're gonna wind up with something that's gonna feel a lot like a narrative prose poem. So what's the difference? If you call it one thing, that's what people are going to call it. <laughs> you know, it's just like, fill the dreams, you build, they'll come. I wrote a novella and won a novel competition. Why? Because I called the novella a novel. <laughs> and it can sometimes be as simple as that. I, I, want, I want Kim or Daniel to have an opportunity to rebut that or agree with that as well. <laughs> I totally agree with that. There's so many poets too who work on the edge of poetry and nonfiction or poetry and memoir, or you see like, like Claudia Rankine, like will win awards for essay mm -hmm. and for poetry for the same book, because it's like, you could definitely make the argument for both. Right. Um, I, I, I totally agree with that. I think the definitions are really porous. Um, and I do think actually there's even for uh, like prose writers who don't work like close to that border, it's really important to learn from poetry. I think, mm -hmm. I think there's so much to take away there. Um, like, I think poetry demands a lot more of the reader often and has a lot more faith in the reader in a certain way, right? It, it, it believes the reader will make connections that aren't obvious and make sort of certain little leaps in logic. And I think when fiction decides to do that too, those moments are often the most powerful. I think poetry encourages you to look at the world around you really carefully and try to see it in new ways and to find fresh language in describing it. And that's useful for all kinds of writing. Uh, so I think it's like all the better that we're all working at the working at the margins a little more. I yeah. love I love those answers. I'm not certain. I guess the only difference would be is a short story or a novel more than a poem for the most part could be adapted for the screen. So and that doesn't mean necessarily that a um, a short story or novel would has to have you know Freytag's triangle or or you know any kind of narrative arc, there is something going on within um, the four corners of a short story or a novel that is probably, probably more visual and has more, I hate to use the word action, but maybe I'll have to use that word action than a poem. But, um, but yeah, I, my poetry collection has several narrative pieces that I, I will, I will admit, I have one poem that actually I also included for, in a short story collection, <laughs> the same one, the exact same piece. So there you go. Yeah, yeah, we, we have these conversations, uh, my students and I have these conversations about, uh, sit, I have them write a sitcom, so they write a spec script for a sitcom. But a lot of times we're like, is that a sitcom though? Because of this, this, and this, and is that a comedy? And, you know, we're blurring those lines, especially with, um, and I don't mean to get too much into, into the film and TV stuff, but with, with, you know, Netflix originals and something can now be 38 minutes instead of 21 minutes and that kind of stuff. So, you know, it's, it's one of those things that I think it's, it gets more difficult to define these things um, as we've sort of uh, broken many of those rules over years and years. Um, and I, I love hearing that too of, you know, I want to, I want to, uh, novel competition because I call, or because I call my novella a novel, you know, um, <laughs> Uh, we also got a question from uh, Howard. 
Um, and uh, Howard says, the oldest writing advice in history is write what you know. Uh, do you agree that we need uh, to be that confined or do you have any advice that might suggest to us how we can branch off from such a limiting approach? So that was, do you agree that we need to be that confined or do you have any advice that might suggest to us how we can branch off from such a limiting approach? Kim, do you have anything to respond to with that? I think anything you write about, you have to treat with a ton of care and empathy and research and in, and you know involvement of a lot of other people, to be fair. Um, I think you you do as much work as possible to make anything you write, you know, you know, to make anything you write as well researched and as like as well researched as possible. And then I think you accept the conversation that happens around a work you create. I think that's the other half of it. Um, I think you you have to think of art as like I think you can write whatever you want and people can respond to whatever they want. And I think that, that is like the true the true reality of like, of, of making art in this world is like that, that's what you want, right? You want to be taking part of a conversation um, and not like you, you, I think you don't want to be trying to control the response to your writing and you have to let other people lead the conversations around your writing uh, and, and, you know, have a multiplicity of opinions. Uh, and I think as long as you, you accept that, then, then you can, then what you, you can write what you want. And like, yeah, that, that's what I think. It's like, do the work, write what you want, uh, except that the conversation will be whatever the conversation is going to be. Yeah, you've got to really, uh, I think you got to really, I don't think you can write stuff without knowing about it. You know, if you're, if you're in that point where you're putting stuff on the page, if it's going to be good, um, I like to bring stuff into my class um, from my, my graduate work was uh, short fiction and poetry, and it ended up being 50 pages or so um, by the end. And um I bring in all of the drafts and all the research I had for that stuff I was doing, you know, where I'm looking up details on this or this, and I drop the whole thing on the, on the front desk in the classroom and papers go falling on the floor. And I say, all of this was to write this, you know? And so I tell them, um, since, since, um, Daniel has already mentioned Hemingway, you know, Hemingway said that, um, he writes, uh, I'll do the PG version. He writes, you know, uh, not nine pages of crap for every one page of good writing. Uh, he tries to make sure the crap ends up in the wastebasket. Um, and so it's kind of, you know, but uh, I think young writers, especially um, these days, students that I teach, they want to get it right the first time. The first thing I write is going to be that thing, but it's, I show them the research that has to, you know, this is all the stuff that you have to know. So um, uh, Daniel or Rand, do you have any, uh, anything else to add to that question? Well, I'll say this. I think what Kim said pretty much summed up what I wanted to say, but I will add that we can tell you what to do, but you're going to do what you're going to do. And I wrote an article for Writer's Digest in the last year about how to write characters of different cultures. And I thought I was being very kind and encouraging, and but I was getting emails from people telling me that I could jump off a bridge because it wasn't what they wanted to hear so i've just learned that with certain things you have to make sure that you're entirely sensitive to what you what you're doing i have students writing essays right now on topics and i tell them i describe it to them this way that topic is dangerous i'm going to let you do it but i want you to think of it this way there are shards of glass all over the floor you have to navigate through the shards. And if you get cut, you gotta let, you know, you gotta deal with the bleeding. Uh, and what we wanna do is try to avoid getting cut. And you're never gonna please everybody. So ultimately you have to make that decision yourself. There's, there's one other, there's a step to this too, is I think you should interrogate why you want to write something, um, why you wanna write it, why it is you who should write it. Um, really question your motivations. I think especially if you're having a lot of fear and you're doing things like like email ran after an essay like I, I think you need you need to like look inside yourself and say why do I want so badly to tell this story um if so many other people are telling me it's a bad idea yeah I totally agree a couple of years ago I wrote a piece for the Guardian on why Latinx writers were so upset about the American dirt fiasco 
where a white writer was paid seven figures to write what um, many of us would call trauma porn, uh, where Mexican characters were centered. Um, and um, the argument I make is not so much that a non-Mexican or Chicana wrote it, it's that um, it was filled with so many stereotypes and rather wooden descriptions of skin color and other things. And she got paid seven figures for this. When, as the great novelist Luis Urrea said, they don't pay Mexicans that much to uh, publish their books. Um, so people should write what they want. They should do their research. They should interrogate why they're doing it. That's everything that uh, Kim and, and Rand are saying. But also the publishing industry needs to look deep into its soul and, and think about why they're paying seven figures to a non-Mexican or non-Chicana to write a book about the great pain and suffering, the alleged Mexican grapes of wrath, you know, um, of, of American dirt. So um, anyway, that's my, I'll get off my soapbox. <laughs> uh, thanks, that's a great, great answers to that. Um, uh, even though I had some other great questions, so I so want the answer. I'm gonna to have to ask you all over email later the answers to some of these questions because I'm genuinely curious. We do have another uh, another question from one of our guests, and and we'll make this um, last big question. Then um, we'll have you all talk a little bit about upcoming projects you have, and just remind people of um, uh, how they can find your books. Um, so uh, Cliff Garstang, who I know, and apparently Daniel knows yes. too, because he also says, hi, Daniel, and hi, Joe. I and so I, I know I know Cliff outside of the uh, Festival of the Book. Yes. Um, uh, Cliff says, conventional wisdom is that short fiction is difficult to publish because the market for short stories is limited. Do you agree that's true? And what advice do you have for people who write and want to publish short fiction? Well, okay, Cliff just, is a... Oh, go ahead. Go ahead, Rand. No, you got it, Daniel. I would just say... Like, Cliff is a wonderful writer. So, so for me, it's write whatever the heck you want. If you want to do short stories, you want to do poetry, you want to do plays, novels, I, you know, whatever floats your boat. For me, writing is an artistic expression. So I love the short story form. And um, all, almost all my, I think almost all my short story collections have been published by university presses. God bless university presses, you know, and small presses. Um, there'll be a publisher. If you work hard and you find the right support group in terms of other writers and, and, and folks who can help you get to the right place, it'll get published. Right. I was going to add that there are a lot of places that would publish short fiction. You just have to understand that they're probably not going to be major houses. So if you if your idea of publishing is getting an agent doing the New York route, then you know that's not going to be the most conducive way of getting there with short stories. But there are a lot of smaller presses, indie presses uh, that love this type of work. University presses, as Daniel mentioned, and then there's also, and I'm pretty sure that a lot of people think about this as a third rail, but you can self-publish it yourself. Uh, and that's that's a whole conversation for another day, another panel. Kim, do you have any advice there? I agree about small presses. And also there's, there's lots of like lit journals. Like there's a lot of great outlets that publish stories serially. Um, that is a good place to start. Um, I would also say you're never going to run out of people telling you not to write something. Um, I also say it takes so long to write a book and no one actually knows what sells. <laughs> no one actually knows the market. The market moves very fast. The market moves in surprising ways. Um, I feel like people have been saying that my entire career is that like short stories are hard to publish. And what has actually happened in my observations is short stories go in waves. You know, like there are times when they're more popular and times when they're less popular. There are years when all kinds of like great collections come out and, you know, sometimes with the big houses. Uh, and it's just, and then no one, no one actually knows. I, I feel like if you try to chase the market and what you think people will buy or what people will want or what publishers will want, editors will want, you're never gonna get anywhere. I, I think you can only write what is what truly compels you and what you truly love. Like that's the only way you're gonna make art that you're happy with and you're proud of and you'll have a writing life that makes you happy and is satisfying. Yeah, I mean, do people tell sculptors, you know, hey, don't sculpt that because there's just too many 
of that being sculpted, you should sculpt this. I mean, I, you don't hear, <laughs> you don't hear folks saying stuff like that. So, yeah, even our even our first question, I sort of quin, I sort of cringe to write it, but it's what the panel's about is about short fiction. But how often does it happen that when you're uh, talking to three novelists, someone says, "So why the novel?" <laughs> or three poets why poetry but short fiction we're always like but why that you know it's like in between things you know so why did you pick that well you didn't go for the extremes um and so it seems to always be and i cringe writing i cringe sending it to you ahead of time and i was like oh man i hope this you know but it's it's a form that i love but it, it also is sort of how this panel has been you know built around that idea of concision and so i thought it would be weird to not talk about it um I, so I had this question that I wanted to ask, and, I, and instead I will just make a statement to those of you who are, who are watching. Um, these stories um, that, that Kim and Daniel and Rand have written have these unforgettable conclusions. And I will just say, I was, I was left so often with your stories of just those moments when you just got to get up and like walk around and be with your thoughts. And that happened with so many of the stories that the three of you wrote where um, you just, you, you hit with such a great punch at the end of those that I, you know, I couldn't, I, so many people want to like binge, you know, like TV shows and, and no, not for me. I, I was, I was reading these and I got to get up and walk around go think, go for a walk and think about it for a while. So, and they just, they resonated, they stayed with me. So these are unforgettable conclusions um, that your stories do have. Um, finally, I want to give you a chance to talk about any upcoming projects, promote those things, um, and then and then I'll have some some closing words for us. So um, we'll just go in order again, Kim, if you don't mind telling us um, any upcoming projects or activities or things you want people to know about. I mean, I'm mainly here just for this book. <laughs> like this, this is the main thing I want people to know about. Is like, please, is please, I I hope you'll check it out. I hope you'll read it. I hope pass around everyone to everyone you know if you do like it. All right, thanks, Daniel. Um, because I'm a compulsive writer, um, my, I've started, um, I've almost completed a new collection, which includes some older stories, but some uh, five brand new stories. And it's called, the collection's called My Chicano Heart, New and Collected Stories of Love and Other Transgressions. And because I realized I, over the years, I've written about love quite a bit. And I, I think it's, uh, it's an interesting topic. So hopefully I'll get that placed with a lovely publisher. Great, thanks, Daniel. Mm -hmm. Brand? Uh, actually, next month on April 12th, I have another collection of 100 word stories coming out called The Library of Afro Curiosities. And then in November, I have a Christmas book, my first Christmas book. I always wanted to have the black version of a Christmas story. It's called A Different Kind of Christmas Story. <laughs> and the title came courtesy of Grant Faulkner. He was like, you should just name it that. Uh, so it's actually a story told entirely in 100 word chapters about a kid and his quest to get a Mr. T action figure for Christmas. All right, great. Thanks. Thanks so much to the three of you. And, and, um, uh, and thanks to, I better thank the Virginia Festival of Books. I want you to have me back um, and, and have our authors back um, as well. Thank you all so much for um, uh, sharing your perspective on this and sharing your work with us. Um, I, I, I will encourage as a, as a um, person with no, no uh, stake in this, um, I encourage you to, to um, buy these books. Uh, it's time for us to wrap things up. So thank you um, to Kim and Daniel and Ran and to everyone who tuned in. Um, please consider buying these featured books from your local bookseller. Um, and there are some links provided on uh, vabook.org. That's V-A-B-O-O-K.org or through the links that have just appeared in the chat. Um, and you can also, and we encourage you to explore the rest of the 2022 Virginia Festival of the Book Schedule, which runs through March 20th at vabook.org. Again, that's vabook.org. Thanks so much, everybody. Thank you, Joe. Bye, Kim. Bye, Ran. Thank you. <laughs> Bye, Thank you. Okay. Bye, Take care. Bye, Bye everybody. Thank you, Sarah. <laughs>